All right, I, I call the meeting of I call the meeting of House Education Policy Committee to order. Um, we have a quorum. Um, we are going to have a, a long day today. Um, we're doing our makeup day, and we were doing an extra um, meeting today too to hear more bills before we we get into deadline. So thank you, members, for your um, perseverance and um, for the marathon um, for education uh, policy today. Um, so we'll try to keep things moving um, on the schedule um, and uh, appreciate uh, that if everyone, if we, we will have time for a discussion, but if we can keep our remarks very um, succinct and pointed to um, our questions, um, we'd very much appreciate that. And then just a reminder to all testifiers today that um, we will. We do have time limits, and that we will need to move things along to make sure that we're hearing all of the bills that we would like to get to today. And we've got some great work ahead of us, um, and we will continue to be flexible during the day to make sure that we're meeting member needs. Um, so thank you all for for that uh, uh, indulgence uh, ahead of time. Appreciate that. All right, uh, we are going to hear our first bill of the morning, which is House File 1348. Um, Representative Tapke is the bill author. Madam Chair. And Madam Chair. Can do it. Minutes. Minutes. Minutes, yeah. Oh, well, I'm sorry, you're right. Minutes first. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Yes, Representative Tapke here. He got caught up. He's what? He was No, I think she looked at that. Oh. <laughs> All right. So we'll, we'll start with the minutes. Uh, Representative Frazier, would you please move the minutes for us so this moved, morning? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Uh, any discussion of the minutes? All right. Hearing none. All in favor of approving the minutes from, uh, we have them from uh, yesterday, Tuesday, February 28th. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We do have the minutes, and we do not have our first bill author, so I, we know that Representative Clardy, um, would you be able to step up and be our first bill this morning? Thank you, Representative Clardy. So to let members know, we have, let's see, let me, we have House File 1773. Um, Representative Clardy um, is our bill author. Thank you for being here this morning and ready to go, first thing. All right, uh, Representative Clardy, um, I, I will please, I will move your bill, um, House File 1773, before the committee to be re referred to the Education Finance Committee. Um, all in favor? Or, no, that's right, we don't say that right now. So the bill is before us. Um, and Representative Clardy, I do not see a amendment. So we will begin with your presentation. If you would introduce yourself and um, present your bill. Great. Would you like my testifiers to come up now? Or? Yep, that would be great, great if they were ready to go. All right, Representative Clardy, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. I'm really excited to present this bill that will have long-term positive systemic changes. The goal of file, House File uh, 1773 is making ongoing investments in EL, I'm sorry, English learners, EL, students with limited or interrupted formal education, SLIFE, and staff that they serve. Both groups of students represent a fast-growing uh, demographic from grades K to 12. ELs and SLIFE learners also have an incredible talents and assets to offer, and they are foundational, growing, um, foundational to, gr for, to a growing Minnesota workforce in the 21st century. Um, One-time investment in ELs and SLIFE learners are critical, and so are long-term investments ongoing investments in staff and programs that serve ELs. That is indexing to the base educational formula allowance. Both are necessary in closing gaps. 
both funding approaches um, present racial, racially equitable ways for supporting staff and programming uh, for ELs. Linking the EL basic skill revenue and the EL um, concentrated, um, concentration revenue to the basic education formula allowance um, represents an incremental yet important approach to investing in ELs and SLIFE. Longer term investments in ELs and SLIFE learners like indexing can reduce the need to cr for cross subsidies in the future as investments are ongoing and align well with critically needed one time investments in reducing the EL cross subsidy. Incremental investments must meet the needs of EL and SLIFE learner learners, teachers and staff and to be racially equitable. So to do um, some of the financial investments need to be directed to the Minnesota Department of Education to provide adequate um, levels of support and accountability. This basis is for healthy um, state and local education agency relationships to ensure ELLs are served, um, served with academic ex excellence and achieve with investment being proposed in the bill and other bills proposed. Racially equitable. Racial equity for ELs is about getting better academic results and less racially predictable outcomes. Strong state and local education agency partnerships rooted in support and accountability speak to that dynamic. Racial equity for ELs and SLIFE learners is a moral and imperative and is imperative to posse. That's people of color and indigenous for those of you that are wondering. Um, supporting ELs and SLIFE um, learners by providing uh, financial policy-based investments in students, the staff, and the EL and the SLIFE learner programs and services is both good policy as well as race equity-centered education. And I would like to turn it over to my first testifier, mm -hmm. Chair uh, Pryor. Thank you. I have um, Dr. Rev Hillstrom. Yes. And please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Representative. <clears throat> Asio Tohaja, greetings, relatives. My name is Rev Hillstrom, Dr. Rev Hillstrom. I serve our state currently as the director of edu or excuse me, the director of research for the Minnesota Educational Equity Partnership, whose executive director is one of your former colleagues, Representative Mariani. Um, I want to just briefly tell you a little bit about my story. I was the assistant director of teaching and learning at, the, at that time the largest district in the state, St. Paul, with well over 100 languages. I left there and went and took a position in the fifth largest district at that time, which was Osseo Area Schools, and my role was the director of educational equity. In that role, I was responsible for EL programming and services for the district. Um, I did not have a micro-credential, and that's actually the component of the bill that I'm here to speak about. It took me two years to grow into my understanding of what was necessary to support from a racial equitable position around EL students and emerging multilingual students. There are four areas that I'd like to briefly highlight that I needed to learn and that I think should be included in a micro-credential that would lead to a more equitable opportunity for students. The first, as administrators, we are instructional leaders and Minnesota educational leaders, I believe, would benefit from learning the best practices in the, in the field of um, EL or emerging multilinguals, especially the shift towards what we are referring to as culturally validating pedagogy. I don't have time to go into great lengths with that, but there is a model that we are using called the CLEAR model through um, Manip that will help with that and you'll see in our State of Students of Color report. The second is around data collection and analysis. Um, Access data, we know many students are still spending longer than seven years in our EL program, so something's obviously wrong there. Uh, performance data, when we understand performance data is not a detriment to students, but within our system, it allows us opportunities to adjust our system. Third, behavioral data, and fourth, just student survey data overall. The third uh, area is around family and student communication. I believe there's tremendous opportunities. Most districts get things out in English and maybe weeks or even never later in multiple languages to support. And the fourth is around financing uh, education here in the state of Minnesota for emerging multilinguals, which you alluded briefly to. The cross subsidy right now that's currently at play isn't even enough to pay for the programming that is currently at play and is not sufficient in meeting the needs of our students. That said, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to be part of this conversation this morning, Madam Chair.
Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Rachel Higgins. Oh. Or, or I'm sorry, I read it in the wrong order. It, it is no. Heather Nice. Oh. <laughs> but either one of you can go, no, and I'm I apologize sure. for skipping over. We're ready no matter what. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Good morning, Please Madam say. Chair and members. My name is Heather Nyseth, and I'm an English language program facilitator in District 196. I have the, had the honor, privilege, and pleasure of teaching multilingual learners since 2006. I'd like to start by telling you about one of my students and his learning journey. Jose first came to Minnesota two years ago from El Salvador at 16 years old. In El Salvador, the fields were Jose's classroom. Beginning at age 10, Jose spent his time growing and harvesting crops instead of attending school. Jose as a student identified as life or a student with limited or interrupted formal education. Although Jose's knowledge of cultivation is vast, he is building his understanding of concepts taught in our schools. But for Jose, school is a gift and a privilege. When asked when he feels most happy, he responded, when I'm at school. When I first started my teaching journey, Minnesota had 58,000 multilingual learners. 17 years later, there are over 79,000. That's a 36% increase, and the influx of multilingual students, including SLIFE learners, is expected to continue to grow. Because the landscape of students has shifted, so too must instruction. However, research shows that teachers feel ill-equipped to meet the needs of multilingual students. A 2018 study showed that over 70% of teachers stated their educational programs had not prepared them to provide instruction that meets the needs of English learners. That's one reason why this bill is important, because teachers will be provided with six hours of professional learning from experts in the field of language acquisition, which would help them acquire the instructional tools necessary to meet the needs of their linguistically gifted students. Madam Chair and members, I ask that you support this bill so that students can receive an inclusive, equitable education that's relevant to the amazing cultures represented within our state. Oh. Thank you, thank you. And now, <laughs> Rachel Higgins. And please identify yourself and proceed. Of course. Uh, we're done with musical chairs. Hi. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. My name is Rachel Higgins, and I'm an English language teacher in Prior Lake Schools. Since 2010, I've worked at four elementary schools within our district, as well as the Alternative Learning Center, which is our high school. Um, our district currently has over 60 home languages, and this year we've had many new-to-country students from Russia, Ukraine, China, and Vietnam, with varying levels of by literacy in English and their home language. Currently, I work with 42 students every day at Hamilton. Uh, I teach six grade levels. They're in kindergarten through sixth grade. I don't know that I could win the show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? But I do teach all the grade levels. During my ESL programming, uh, my licensure, I studied second language acquisition theory, metalinguistic strategies, and applied grammar in addition to co-teaching and a lot of push-in pedagogy, which means I go into the classroom to teach. I can confidently tell you today that I am an expert in embedding language objectives into the learning targets we teach our students every day, while simultaneously acting as a social worker, resource officer, and cultural liaison between many worlds. Learning the content standards, I still haven't mastered them, especially when I work between elementary and high school, depending on the year and our caseloads. I strategically co-taught one grade level per year in elementary to learn the rigorous kindergarten through fifth grade language arts standards. Last year, I had to learn economics, US government, and chemistry standards alongside my juniors and seniors. Um, even though um, I feel confident about the progression of reading and writing, my efforts would not be nearly as successful if not for the collaboration and dedication of my general education colleagues. I'm good at my job, but I'm not that good. I acknowledge that my 30 minutes of support are nowhere near sufficient to support my students' English proficiency levels. This bill would provide opportunities not only for ESL teachers, but also for general education teachers to all be language development teachers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have no more testifiers. Um, member discussion, Representative Erdahl. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I uh, just want to comment that, uh, you know, obviously it's 
very important to be able to understand and speak English uh, when you're in our public schools. Uh, I was teaching back in the days where this problem was, was first becoming evident. Uh, I taught it in London Spicer, and we had a great influx, well, not a great, but we had several families uh, from Vietnam in the early 80s in our school. And uh, I can't imagine how it must have been for them, because I'm talking and they're not understanding a word I, I'm saying to them. I, one of them I was fortunate could interpret. So one day I had this, you know, I was talking about immigration, and I had this question, uh, trying to get an inspiring answer. It was, why did you come to the United States? I thought, you know, escape communism or whatever. And my interpreter asked the question, and the student said, I didn't mean to. I got on the wrong boat. I thought I was going fishing. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we just emphasizing how important it is uh, for programs like this. But one question that I have, and I don't know if, if you can answer Representative Plotty or uh, perhaps someone from uh, the department, but uh, apparently uh, for every dollar, uh, 25 cents goes to the school districts, and 75 cents of this goes to the Department of Education. Um, I'm interested to know why that is the case, and uh, you know, perhaps uh, you know, someone from the department can, emph can uh, emphasize to us uh, what expenses would be incurred by the department to do this. Yep. And Representative Clarity, I'll, I'll give you the option of answering or calling on um, our department. Perfect. I am going to do a combination of both. All right. I'm going to uh, call uh, John uh, Peterson, <laughs> uh, Dr. John, um, and um, I want to start off by addressing that, um, maybe it's more of a question, but did you know that there's one person that's ahead of it, um, like the ELL department for the whole state of Minnesota? So that was the initial thought. Um, the, um, the other piece is that um, I'm looking at possibly doing some different type of changes with the formula on that, but it was my initial sight on, on that piece. I'm also thinking about that maybe that might not be the route, that maybe it'd be more a, a better place to do LEAP, but I'm going to actually turn it over to John. He didn't know he was testifying today, so thank you very much. <laughs> and we'll, if you would please uh, you? identify yourself. And I guess we have a question. Sounds good, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Leotawa, Dr. Robert John Peterson, and um, a committee member. Uh, we are open, I think, to what is best for serving the needs of English learners in the state of Minnesota in equitable ways and supporting those programs and the staff that work those programs. LEAPS was a very innovative policy frame that came out in 2014, and we believe that we need to strengthen that policy frame. And one of the ways to do that is through um, providing funding and resources to LEAPS to provide the department with the supports that they need to, to be effective in providing support and, and uh, accountability uh, to the school districts. The old saying is that a healthy relationship has both support and accountability into it. We also know that the local education agencies have been really strapped in terms of being able to provide the services mm -hmm. based on the funding. And, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, so. but we also have someone else that can answer the specific oh, question that came sure. up and I appreciate your comments right Thank now. Um, I think uh, Mr. Uni from the department. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for um, addressing some of the concerns that we're hearing from our, our member. You're welcome. Madam Chair, my name is Ado Shuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations. I'm just kind of up to be able to field the question, and I may have to say i am come back with the information. So, uh, Representative Erdahl, could you just repeat uh, the kind of the direct question so I can have a little bit more Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the question was that uh, apparently of every dollar in this program, 25 cents goes to the school district, 75% to the Department of Education, and I'm just wondering uh, if you can give some clarity as to uh, how that money would be expended uh, by the department. Mr. Oney. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, committee members. So 
my understanding from the bill is that this funding would be used for uh, funding uh, FTEs or positions for um, doing data analysis, technical assistance, guidance to districts around accountability measures for the use of this funding. Um, one of the things that we know, especially from um, and now data analysis in terms of performance and outcomes for our students who receive dedicated funding or are the targets, targets for the dedicated funding is that we know um, academically we want to see better outcomes. And so what we would be doing is using the funding for um, working with districts, working with our regional partners um, for uh, uh, implementing evidence-based best practices for math, for literacy, for English learning specifically. And I, I think that we do have an excellent question that also in our finance committee we can keep, continue to follow up on, on how. Just one quick one. Follow and a up. follow up, uh, Representative Erlock. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, Mr. Uni, uh, so you mentioned FTEs. Uh, would that be in the department or FTEs with school districts? Uh, Mr. Uni. Uh, Matt. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Myrtle, I mean, ultimately I would defer to, to the author and the advocates for how they would want the, the funding directed, but if the money comes to the department for implementing any type of tasks or requests under this funding for uh, technical assistance, oversight, or guidance for um, accountability measures, we would have funding, we would implement it at the, at the department, and sometimes we would, um, there are other models where we have agreements maybe with our regional centers of excellence run through our service cooperatives if we have a regional approach, but I am not aware of a model where we use state funding to then pass that on to districts other than specifically dedicated our student support personnel uh, proposal where we would put money for districts to, to hire staff. And I'm going to uh, Thank you. pull in our, our finance chair, uh, Representative Joachim. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a quick, so I understand the bill, from what I understand, the funding that's going to end the 50-25-25 split is just on the increase on the indexing of inflation. So we also, uh, members and Ed Finance, are looking at a bill to actually take care of the cross subsidy as well that is going to be going directly to the school districts. My question is actually back on the policy. I noticed here, and I, I appreciate that, um, the hours of training for tier two, three and four teachers. Mm -hmm. um, my concern is that we're not also training our tier one and two teachers. We've done that in previous bills around mental health. And um, as we know, we're getting like, for instance, in special education, over 50% of those teachers are tier one and two right now in Minnesota. So I would want them to get some of this training as well, and maybe that's something we could discuss later, how that would look like. It might not be able to be the full six hours because a tier three teacher, I think it's three years before they have to renew, so that'd be about two hours a year. Tier four, it's five hours to renew, so it's barely over one hour a year, but having the tier one and two teachers um, have that PD for many reasons. One, it's good for the kids. Two, it also gives them the professional development to then utilize um, the uh, pro portfolio process to move into tier three and four. And they're not getting the professional development they need or the help from their district sometimes to do that. So just, uh, just a thought to think about. Yeah, I think good good consideration and something to consider as we as this bill moves forward of, of what that might involve. Uh, Representative Bennett, do you have um, comments at this point or questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just contemplating all this, and Representative Clardy, I appreciate the uh, bringing up ESL because I think it's incredibly important for our districts. It does concern me that the focus seems. Uh, more on the management level rather than the district level, but that's a funding question, so I'll, I'll leave that up. Um, thanks. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Uh, closing comments, Representative Clardy. Mm -hmm. um, I think the time is now. Uh, this We are dealing with a lot of systemic issues um, with our schools, which is evidenced by the achievement gap. So we have the opportunity to look at how to improve school systems by not only funding the ELL program to you know, close the achievement gap, but the indexing and then also the 
um, biker credentialing. So um, this is something I'm passionate about, and I know you are too, because no one likes to live in a state where there's such a large achievement gap. So thank you for your consideration, and I also um, am looking forward to discussing this further in the Ed Finance Committee. Thank you, Madam Representative Chair. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I just have a question real quick. I'm just looking on the on the uh, Representative uh, the agenda, and we skipped over public testimony. There was someone who was signed up for and, the public testimony, and, and he's here. And so you're I right, and I did sure. I did make a mistake, and okay. so, so I just want to make sure discussion. we got <laughs> um, it, uh, So I, I know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shaver, that we did miss your public testimony. Is there um, comments that we could quickly get at this point? <laughs> And, it, and you can take the testimony. And, and I am sorry, I, my eye skipped over because there was a paragraph. <laughs> and, uh, if, if it's going to be moved to finance, my comments are around finance. Perfect. Thank you. Finance. Thank you so much for that understanding. All right. Um, and with that, and I do appreciate that, and we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to those comments in finance. <laughs> I renew my motion to re refer House File 1773 to the Education Finance Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails, and House File 1773 will be moved to Education and Finance. Thank, Thank you for you. being with us and being an unexpected testifier. All right, so now we will move to the top of our agenda again. Um, and we have um, Representative Tadpe. Thank you. And if you have testifiers that want to move up there with you at the same time, this is a good moment for that. Okay. All right, we have House File 1348. Thank you. Members, it is our intention to re-refer re House File 1348 to the Education Finance Committee. Um, and I will make the motion to bring the, the bill before us um, to be re-referred to Education Finance. So Rep Representative Tapke and I believe that you do have um, an amendment that yes. we should ad adopt first. Yes, um, and uh, would you please uh, identify yourself and speak to your amendment? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So my name is Brad Tabke, State Representative for Shakopee, and we have together uh, today the ESP Bill of Rights, uh, which is a great bill for education support professionals. And the uh, amendment, it goes more to the bill, Madam Chair, so I'd rather just add the amendment on, then we can talk about the whole thing. So um, to, to move it right, to move the amendment first and then yes, talk yes. about the bill as a whole. All right. Um, so any questions at this point about um, getting the bill in the, in the way that the author would like it um, with the A3 amendment? All right. Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A3 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We have uh, the bill now, House File 1348, as amended with the A3. All right, and so uh, Representative Tapke, please introduce yourself again and introduce your bill as amended. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Brad Tapke, um, here today we have uh, what I just announced as the ESP Bill of Rights, so educational support professionals. And um, what this bill does is it takes care of the folks to help make sure that our students are taken care of in schools. And so we have uh, a lot of times what happens is we have uh, teachers, which I'm married to a teacher, and so it's incredibly important that we take care of our teachers, but also, uh, uh, the folks that help teachers on a day-to-day -day basis make sure that all of our students are successful uh, throughout the school year. And so what this does, uh, this Bill of Rights bill, what it does is it takes uh, the pay for paras and for uh, janitorial staff, for nutrition staff, for bus drivers, and folks who have student contact that are on hourly, um, hourly wages, uh, that it helps them by adding minimum wage of $25 an hour, gives them access to health insurance, access to paid time to prepare for when they have students uh, that they're working with as e-learning days, uh, paid e-learning days, because right now, uh, like this uh, past week when we had multiple school days off, anybody in your community who has uh, is hourly um, ESP didn't get paid for across the vast majority of the state for that work, and then also for professional development. And so right now, uh, a couple stats for everyone is that uh, the Osseo School District has 72 openings right now for paras, and they have openings of 14 school nutrition folks, and those start at 16.63 an hour, and their next step is only 34 cents. And so what happens there is that 
uh, with the way current uh, funding is and where things are at is that this uh, folks aren't able to get up to a competitive wage for paras and for nutrition and for uh, the, the hourly workers in their school. And so it's really important that we help move that that forward. Probably like Savage School District is short 10 nutrition folks. Uh, St. Peter School District is down 30 drivers for bus routes. And so there is a ton of need across the state of Minnesota. And so this bill will, uh, it sets out what we want to do with the Bill of Rights as well as funding mechanisms for that that are above and beyond the uh, formula so that we don't have that push and pull between uh, what money teachers get and what money ESPs get. And so this is uh, on top of that, which we'll talk about in the uh, finance committee when we hopefully get to there. And so, Madam Chair, we have two testifiers that I believe are, should be hopefully there on Zoom. On Zoom. All right. I have first on my list, Abby Schuft. If you can hear us at this point, would you unmute, unmute yourself and identify yourself and proceed with your testimony? Good morning, Madam Chair and members of committee. My name is Abby Schuft, and I'm an administrative assistant at Westwood Elementary in St. Cloud, and a member of SEIU Local 284. Thank you for letting me share our health insurance experience for the last nine years. When I started with the district in 2014, our health insurance rates were cost-effective and something that I was able to cover for my family. The small lawn irrigation company my husband works for doesn't provide health insurance. I was only making 13.04 an hour as a full-time administrative assistant to the principal and our insurance rates were $225.56 bi-weekly. During this time, my children, ages five, three, and six months, were also covered by medical assistance as their secondary insurance. Two years later, in October 2016, insurance rates for family coverage doubled to $478.91 bi-weekly. Even though my pay rate hadn't increased, I was able to continue um, I was able to continue carrying the family insurance. One year later in October, 2017, insurance rates went up to $614.54 biweekly. At this time, I was no longer able to continue to provide the insurance for my family. After working full-time and paying for insurance, my paycheck would only be $411.64 every two weeks. That's not enough to cover the mortgage of our home. I sent all our information to the county and my children were able to be covered 100% by medical assistance. My husband and I had decided to discontinue the family coverage and only take single coverage medical insurance. Since October 2017, my husband was not, has not had health insurance. We have looked into Minsure every year as an option. However, this so-called low cost insurance isn't affordable to us. I'm not alone. Many of my coworkers in St. Cloud and hourly workers across the state are in a similar position where their entire check would be eaten up by the cost of health insurance, so they opt not to take it. In most school districts, the administrators get the highest employer contribution to their health insurance, the teachers are somewhere in the middle, and the lowest paid staff, the hourly folks like me, get the lowest contribution from the employer. For the last six years, my union, has worked hard in bargaining to win the same contribution the teachers get, but it's still not enough. What's affordable on their salary and what's affordable on mine are not the same thing. I should not have to rely on the state of Minnesota to cover the medical costs for my children when my husband and I both work full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. this, is not, this not only makes me sad to not be able to provide this for my family, it makes me embarrassed and upset. That's why I'm here today. We've got a supportive school board and a strong union, but it's not enough. We need the ESP Bill of Rights to ensure that you can provide, that we can provide for our families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us and providing your testimony. Next up, I have Jessica Gleason. Um, if you can hear us, please unmute and proceed. And I'm sorry, we are having, um, we're on a tight time frame, and, and I hope that uh, I'm going to ask people to limit themselves to two minutes of testimony. Um, and so, Jessica, are you, are you with us? Yes, I will Thank try you. for the two minutes. Um, Chair Pryor, members of the committee, my name is Jessica Gleason. I'm an education support professional at ISD 281 in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. I serve on the executive board as well as the negotiations team for the ESP union. In sharing my story, I raise voices for myself and over 340 ESPs in my district and our desperate need for change. I'm urging you to approve higher quality health insurance and increased wages for ESPs in our state. 
As COVID became prevalent in 2020, I made the tough decision to end a 15-year corporate career, seeking a better way to serve my community at uncertain times. Now, as a full-time paraprofessional, I support secondary level students with severe disabilities, and this has been my greatest career achievement. Since starting as an ESP, I've tightened my budget drastically, but it hasn't been enough. Now I have to make the tough decision to leave my job, leave the fellow EPs, and leave my students. And I know that I've done everything I can to facilitate change. This is why I serve on the union board. After being displaced at the end of the school year, uh, due to seniority, I found another SPED ESP position at an elementary school. This school was severely short-staffed. I sprinted continuously every day, answering calls about numerous special needs students. Because my time was spent so, so sporadically, I wasn't able to give them the support and one-on-one -on -one attention they desperately needed. Each day, I was repeatedly punched, kicked, bitten, scratched, and spat at in my efforts to put out too many fires in such a short amount of time. The stress was unbearable. With more ESPs in that building, we could have made an impact. But with these students, and it was just the two of us, we weren't able to help at all. Now as a board member, I hear the stories of ESPs and their struggles. I listen to them as they worry about their financial uh, stability and the stress that, they, that it causes and the justified reasons on why they want to leave. Can you imagine an hourly wage of $16.69 to support your family? This is the pay for some of our ESPs and for the open positions that we cannot fill. In my first year at this position, I learned that a fellow ESP with 20 more years of experience was making only 30 cents more than me. And now I see that they're choosing to retire just because it's just not worth it. Within the past week alone, I've learned of three more, and that's three more open positions in which we cannot fill. And this affects the ESPs that are currently working with us and their overloaded stress and the result of less time with their students. Let me, know, let me remind you, I know what that's like. And you've probably met these ESPs. They're working in your community and they pick up 18 hour days after working a full day at school. How long will they stay? I'm seeing a historically high number of open ESP positions in the district and the toll it puts on the ones that choose to stay. They're tackling double and triple workloads and will continue to leave. They're including second and third jobs to support their families and they will continue to leave. The issues in recruitment and retention due to low wages and increased cost in insurance will continue to trickle down to the quality of students' education and that's why you need to act now. I'm grateful to be able to share my story with you today, and I hope this sheds light on the importance of valuing ESPs in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Ms. Gleason, thank you so much. Next up, Tina Burkholder. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tina Burkholder, and I'm the Director of Business Service business services at Monticello Public Schools and the Legislative Committee Chair for the Minnesota Association of School Business Officials. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and as a school business official who is responsible for the budget and the costing of labor contracts, I have a few concerns that I would like to comment on House File 1348 as many items have money tied to it. To raise the minimum starting wage to $25 per hour would have huge cost impacts to school districts. It won't only raise the minimum starting wage, but it'll raise the tiered steps that follow and would have to be balanced across all contracts, certified and non-certified, to ensure equitable pay and job duties. With our Magic Child Care program, the higher starting wages will affect our families with raised child care rates. House file 1348 appears to have a spot for funding, but it's unclear on what is being offered. MASBO, along with other education associations, is sending a survey to school districts to gather the related costs. Without even addressing lower class sizes, mental health needs, or raising, rising costs of inflation, the costs associated with House File 1348 and a couple other labor mandates surpass a 5% increase on the general education formula allowance. Passing along the cost to a local property tax levy as an option would be a concern as well, as, Masvo, as Monticello has had two failed referendums in the past couple of years. For health insurance benefits, the language in the bill specifies hours per day without mentioning hours per week. If the employee works one day per week for more than four hours, would they qualify? The language should be modified to include either a minimum hours of works per week or annual hours. Also, school districts often have several different plan offerings with varying costs. Is a required contribution based on the lowest cost plan? 
And if the contributions are different for each plan, this will create additional costs and be harder for HR and business teams to manage simultaneously. And finally, e-learning days can look different for various support staff groups and can happen outside of when school is called for bad weather. For instance, we implemented an e-learning day at our high school this year, so our building could be used as another voting precinct for the city. School districts should have the flexibility to make the best decisions for what is needed given the different and changing circumstances. Thank you for your time today and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Kirk Sch um, Schneid Schneid Schneidwin. Well done, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Kirk Schneider, I'm Executive Director for the Minnesota School Boards Association. Uh, we represent all 331 of our public school districts and two important pieces of our mission are about supporting and strengthening the work of our elected boards. To strengthen the work of our boards, we offer training, training, and more training so they understand that the leadership of the board, administration, uh, and, and the power of the staff create great working relationships among all folks. One of the key elements to this strong and supporting working relationship is trust. And House File 1348, in our view, sends a message to our school boards that the legislature doesn't trust our school boards to do the work that they were elected to do and required to do. State law requires school boards and exclusive reps to meet and negotiate in good faith, which we do, to collectively bargain the terms and conditions of employment. Terms and conditions of employment mean hours of employment, compensation, premiums to group health insurance, and employers' personnel policies affecting the working conditions. State law also states that public employer is not required to meet and negotiate on matters of inherent managerial rights. Every provision within this bill can be collectively bargained. Training, compensation, benefits, work hours during e-learning days, Establishing a new baseline for benefits and pay at the state level significantly impacts the balance at the local bargaining table. It usurps the authority of the school board, does not take into consideration the local district budgeting process and other strategic goals and initiatives that are created by the community that have been established by the board as well as the community. Moreover, each of these provisions will significantly increase the school district costs without any commensurate funding. While offering levy authority may seem like an effective way to fund these costs, we know that this may result in different outcomes. We also know that the, that the meet and confer option offers a great opportunity for staff to meet and provide input on policies and matters relating to their appointment. The role and the responsibility of our boards to Ms. set budgets, Ms. manage Mr. the district, Mr. take I'm care sorry. of it. We are, we are at two minutes. Do you have a, a closing comment? Yes, I do. To wrap it up, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Appreciate and, it. And these school board members are parents, they're farmers, they're bankers, they're moms, they're dads who are stepping forward in their communities to ensure that the public schools remain strong and a foundational piece of their community. Decisions, whether financial or policy related, are best made by those who are closest to the action. Madam Chair, I'll Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your testimony. I, I do have a final person on the list, Marianne Thompson. And thank you for staying to, hope you, also the two minutes um, for public testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Mary Ann Thomas, Director of Human Resources with the Farmington Area Public Schools. I've been an HR administrator in schools for 29 years, and I'm also the president of the Minnesota Association of School Personnel Administrators. Today, I'm testifying on behalf of the following organizations, uh, Minnesota School Boards Association, Minnesota Association of School Administrators, Association of Metropolitan School Districts, Minnesota Rural Education Association, Minnesota Elementary School Principals Association, Minnesota Secondary Principals Association, and Schools for Equity in Education. In the interest of time, I'm gonna keep my comments to two, two, two primary points. On its face, this bill is hard to argue with. It's, it's terrific in many aspects, except for the funding piece of it. In Farmington, um, even with the governor's proposal, we are looking at reducing our budget for 23-24 by $2 million. This bill alone, without the amendment for today, 
would cost $2 million. So if it's funded for two years, that's terrific. But at the end of that two years, we would have to take that money from other places within our budget um, to cover the costs of all of these things that are usually bargained. My second and final point is specifically with regard to the premiums on the health insurance. We have three plans right now, two Cadillac plans and one high deductible plan where we're trying to, and have been for 10 years, get people to that plan. Paying the same premium for all three plans absolutely derails the plan that we have in the district of having higher and better consumers of health care. And so I thank you for your time this morning. Thank you so much for your testimony. You were very succinct, <laughs> and you made excellent points. Um, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, having no more testifiers, um, Representative Erdl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And you know, certainly it's important to do things and have money to uh, attract and, and retain uh, employees through our school districts. I mean, my wife worked many years as a paraprofessional, so I, I understand this. Um, there's some uh, maybe unintended consequences that uh, have been brought to me, uh, and some of them have already been uh, mentioned uh, by previous testifiers, but I'd just like to focus on one regarding uh, our bus companies. Uh, you know, many bus companies contract with school districts, but they also operate trucks uh, independent of their uh, school operations. Now, would, am I correct in, in looking at this, Representative Tabke, would, would this require them to pay all employees, the school bus drivers and the truck drivers, uh, $25? Representative Tabke. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Erdahl. Um, that is uh, not entirely correct in this. No, it would re require them, yes, to be paid $25 as they are uh, driving bus for schools and for kids. For outside of that purview, if they don't have student contact at that time, is not covered under this bill. Follow-up? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to get that clarified. Um, you know, the concern in, in raising uh, these uh, 25, which is above prevailing wage in some of our counties um, is that uh, we, we have bus companies out there who, was, who have suffered uh, through the pandemic and over these last few years uh, and have not been able to buy the new buses and do the repairs maybe that they need to be making. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that this might uh, prohibit them from being able to do their operations in the, the manner that I think would be safer and better. Thank you. Representative Bigberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Tabke. Um, this, I think just at a very basic level, the, the goal of this bill, Representative Tabke, is, is admirable. We want our, our, our paras, our bus drivers, our cooks, custodians to be able to provide for their families. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the basic gist as you and I have, have talked about. Mm -hmm. but, um, Obviously, I have significant concerns. They were echoed um, by, by many of the testifiers. But um, really, the, the big concern is the long-term implication. And, and we can talk more about it in, in finance. Uh, but with that, that school property tax uh, covering the employee health premiums, um, that we have just seen in different contracts that that's blown up budgets and would have significant concerns about that. But again, uh, I think the problem you're trying to solve is admirable, but as testifiers talked about, there's just a huge financial concern that will hamstring districts for years to come. I appreciate, um, and we knowing knowing that uh, those financial, particularly those financial concerns, would be heard in our next next committee. Representative or Re Representative Yuoki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just quick question, and I'm sorry we haven't got a chance to talk about this, but. On the health insurance piece, do we know about how many districts are, provide health insurance to paras and what the usual hour rate is? From the ones I've talked to, districts may offer and say, if you work 30, you know, six hours a week, you can get health insurance, or if you get work 30, but they're not getting the hours in that week to actually be able to take advantage of that health insurance. And the concerns with, I appreciate you trying to tackle the concerns with the e-learning days because we're starting to see districts 
instead of pivoting to snow days when, where they wouldn't have to pay their employees unless we made that, unless we had a snow days bill again, which I don't want to go through again. Um, <laughs> but the e-learnings, the e a lot of districts, our district just went to an e-learning day and our paras were paid. But some districts aren't doing that right now. And I, I, I do want, I, this is important to address in this, to make sure, because the paras are still needed during e-learning in many cases. Um, there's some questions buried in there. Choose which ones you want to answer. I haven't had enough coffee right. today. I, I heard a couple questions in there. that, And so Representative Tapke, take it away and, and respond to what you're able to. Thank you, Chair Pryor. And uh, so with this, yes, that is uh, absolutely one of the pieces that we're trying to get at with the health insurance side of things is that there's a cap and we don't want, uh, we there's often a cap for many paras to being uh, able to access health insurance within the school district because it uh, has a cap of hours and so we don't want to be uh, going just under those hours. So we want to make sure that everyone is covered in here. I don't have the data to exactly how many do cover and don't cover um, that, but I'm sure that we can get that for when we come to finance to talk about uh, the formula as to how this is going to all be paid for as a significant amount of concern, and rightfully so. Um, I have been working with my local district on this bill and running through it with them um, to make sure that we have uh, paths forward that do not injure districts, because we all have the same goals of making sure, as the testimony was up here, of uh, smaller class sizes. We don't want this to impact that uh, piece, but we also want to make sure that everyone in the school districts are taken care of and we don't want uh, to be second class uh, employees on things. We want to make sure that everyone is um, is uh, is contributing to the, the health and the education of our students. So that's that's where we're headed with all of this and I'm very open to talking to anyone who wants to uh, talk about it as as we go forward. Thank you. Representative Bennett. Thanks Madam Chair. I'll, I'll just make some comments, and I'm going to throw out some questions that you can or don't don't need to answer uh, either way. But um, <laughs> for our bill author, but first of all, um, in regards to Representative Erdahl's comments in the bill language, it says all employees, and it does not stipulate student contact. So I'm I'm thinking districts this this will affect all employees. Um, I know this isn't a finance committee, and we'll have further discussion there. But just just a comment about this. In other committees, in our finance committee, we're hearing property tax relief, which I think is great. We're, we're doing that for our taxpayers. And yet, in this one, then we're turning around saying districts can levy for this, and we're going to raise that. And so it's like putting money in one pocket of the taxpayer and pulling it out of the other pocket. And I don't think that seems very fair or transparent. And l lastly, I'm just wondering where bargaining units fit in. Are, are we intending the state to take the place of our local bargaining units and also our local school boards? Are we having the legislator act, legislature act as state school boards? I don't think that's right either. This, you know, I believe this is brought forward in good faith and these employees are very important, but this is a local issue and it should stay local. So thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Bennett. I'm going to turn to you, uh, Representative uh, Tabke, um, to respond yeah, as you. you're able, and then also roll right into your Perfect. closing comments. We'll do. Uh, so, Representative Bennett, thank you so much for those questions. Um, it is uh, not um, accurate to say with this bill that um, it is money coming in one pocket and out the other pocket. That's just not. Uh, that is not what will end up happening in this bill. This is obviously not the finance committee, so we're not talking all about the finance piece, but just to set the table for when we are at finance, that that is not what will happen with this bill. I mean, it is uh, simply, it is making sure that we have, um, that we are taking care of the pieces that we need to be taken care of as, as we move forward for the school districts. And from the legislative perspective, uh, in closing, this, this bill is intended to set the floor of what our values are and what we care about and what we make sure is happening within our school districts. And that's what I believe the legislature is here for. We're not trying to usurp power from anybody. I'm a mayor. I'm a former mayor, local control guy, like that's what uh, I think that as many of the decisions as possible should be made as local as possible. Um, 
And this, it simply is not following that track as districts have been pushed so far by not being funded by the state that people are not getting what they need in order to live full lives, as we heard from the testimony. So I just look forward to everyone's support and also reiterating that I'm very willing and wanting to work with anybody who wants to uh, work with to find solutions for this to make sure that folks are uh, paid adequately and they have uh, access to benefits in our schools. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate everyone's support. All right. Uh, thank you, Representative Tapke. And with that, I renew my notion, motion to re-refer House File 1348 as amended to the Education Finance Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. All right. The motion carries. And we'll hear more in House and Education Finance. Thank you, thank Representative Tapke, for being with us this morning. All right. Next up, we do have Representative Jordan, who is with us. And this is House File 1691. As you look through your packets on our next bill. All right. All right Rep Welcome, Representative Jordan. Welcome back. All right. Um, House File 1691. It's our intention to re-refer um, HF 1691 to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Um, I will make the motion to bring House File to bring HF 1691 before the committee um, to be re-referred. Re um, so great to have you here, Representative Jordan. I don't see an amendment. And so please introduce yourself and um, uh, introduce yourself and introduce your bill. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair Pryor and members. Uh, my name is Sydney Jordan. I represent 60A here in the House. And I am here to remind you all that Minnesota has a strong commitment to collective bargaining. Over 400,000 of our fellow Minnesotans are members of unions, which is just over 16% of our workforce. And for too long, working people have been forced to deal with a global pandemic, social crises, and economic uncertainty. And are right now, Minnesotans are responding by organizing new workplaces and expanding their existing unions. And unfortunately, many of our educators are barred from certain labor protections. House File 1691 addresses these barriers by allowing our tier one teachers and early learning educators to join in the bargaining unit, um, extending due process protections for early childhood, family education, and adult basic education teachers so the educators of our youngest and oldest students in public schools have the same freedom to speak out about what's happening in their classrooms as other teachers. This bill clarifies the ability of teachers to negotiate over the proper use of e-learning days. It aligns probationary periods between cities of the first class and other school districts, so no teacher has to spend six years on probationary status. And returning probationary periods to 60 days for three consecutive years instead of 120 days, so we do not penalize people receiving treatment for cancer or giving birth to premature children. The latest change in this bill expands the mandatory subjects of bargaining to include staffing for all public employees and class sizes, testing, and student personnel ratios for school employee unions. <coughs> we know that educators care about much more than their compensation. They want to control and a voice over the learning environments that their students are learning in, and they want to have a voice in the future of their profession. It is time for state law to reflect that. <coughs> over the past years, we've seen strikes at two of the largest school districts in the state, including mine, over teacher interest in negotiating class sizes. We cannot pretend any longer that this is not a working condition our public employees face. This bill recognizes the power of public decision making and allows transparency about how staffing decisions are made at our schools. Uh, please support House File 1691. And I know uh, Ms. Para is gonna go over, this is a large bill and not all of, and some of it has been examined in the Labor Committee, some of it will be examined in subsequent committees. And I'm hoping that Ms. Para can go over the sections of the bill that are relevant to this committee. Um, and then I think we should turn it over to testimony from uh, President Greta Callahan, who is the president of Minneapolis Federation of Teachers, Local 59, and Meg Luger, who is the staff attorney in Education Minnesota, who can help answer technical questions. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Jordan. So we will turn to Ms. Parra for a walkthrough of the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, sections two through nine of the bill um, uh, are the sections most directly related to the issues in the purview of the committee. Um, section two requires um, negotiation with the teachers before the adoption of an e-learning day. Section three allows a teacher with a tier one license to be in the teacher's bargaining unit. 
Um, section four allows community education and early childhood family education teachers to obtain tenure or continuing contract. Um, sections um, five and six are um, the ones that deal with the probationary period uh, for teachers. Section seven um, uh, modifies the definition of public employee for purposes of, uh, of PELRA so that uh, temporary or seasonal district or charter school employees would be uh, uh, counted as public employees. Section seven modifies the definition of teacher for purposes of, of bargaining. Um, uh, section nine requires uh, bargaining over staffing ratios, class sizes, uh, student testing, and student to personnel ratios. Um, and uh, those are sections two through nine, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now turn to our first testifier as part of the presentation, Greta Callahan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. My name is Greta Callahan, and I am a kindergarten teacher on release from the Minneapolis Public Schools, currently serving as president of the teachers chapter of the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers. I'm also the mother of a student in the district. I'm here today to testify in support of House File 1691. While there are several portions of the bill that I believe will improve the quality of education in both Minneapolis and Minnesota as a whole, my time is short, so I'd like to focus on three sections. First, section two would require school districts to meet and negotiate with the exclusive representative of teachers before adopting an e-learning plan rather than merely consulting with the union. I can share firsthand that consulting consists of management letting us know that they were implementing a plan. When we as teachers saw the many issues with our current e-learning plan, we shared concerns and changes that we would like to see. We've been completely ignored. Under the current language, educators in Minneapolis and other districts are working under a one-size-fits-all approach that fails to meet the needs of our students and their families. If teachers were able to negotiate around this issue, which obviously affects our working conditions, we would immediately advocate for a plan that recognizes that different grade levels and learners deserve a plan that matches their needs. We would also demand our employers acknowledge the time and skill required to suddenly move our lessons online and fairly compensate teachers for the extra work outside of the duty day, usually late at night or early that morning before students are reporting. We would take into account my former student who lived in a one bedroom apartment with his two siblings who were also attempting to do e-learning as their mom was working at a grocery store. It's impossible without headphones. It's impossible without support from a parent or older sibling under this current one size fits all approach. Now let's take into account our attendance on these days. This current plan is set up to disproportionately harm our students living in poverty who also happen to be a majority of students of color. For context, over half our students qualify for free and reduced lunch in Minneapolis. On one end of town, attendance on these e-learning days has been close to 90% and on the other end of town, it's closer to 10%. Without internet, devices, differentiation and supports, the current plan does not meet the needs of our students and creates a wider gap between the haves and the have-nots. Next, section four of the amendments would allow tier one teachers and early learning educators to join the same union that represents tiers two, three, and four teachers in the school district, if those tier one teachers choose to do so. Many of our tier one teachers in Minneapolis are black, indigenous, and people of color who come from communities that have been historically oppressed and disadvantaged. In my role, I spend each day in a different building talking to teachers in Minneapolis. And every single day, I have tier one teachers coming up to me asking, what they need to do to join our unit, and they share examples of why they so desperately need the same protections that their peers have. Allowing them to join with the other teachers in their work sites will be empowering, it'll raise their pay, and give our tier one teachers more protections against discrimination in the workplace. Bringing them into our larger union will also make MFT and unions like ours more effective advocates for all our teachers and communities by adding new voices and fresh perspectives to our union's deliberation and bargaining goals. I'd also like to highlight section 10, which I do think is relevant for this committee, um, which would expand the mandatory subjects of bargaining to include class sizes, testing, and student to personnel ratios. As you may know, MFT and many other unions of educators have been raising these issues at the bargaining table for several years, always over the protests of negotiators on the other side who believe these should uh, stay the prerogatives of management. They're simply wrong. Our schools are not businesses. Our students are not market share. They're humans who all deserve a world-class education. 
It's not just about me trying to teach 40 kids at a time. It's about 40 kids needing to learn at one time. They deserve individualized attention, differentiated instruction, small groups, and the ability to develop relationships with their teachers and classmates. That's impossible when we have kids sitting on wall heaters because there isn't space to add more chairs to the classroom. When maximum class sizes or counselor to student ratios are put into a contract, it's an enforceable promise to everyone about how that school will operate for the next two years. It's a promise parents can count on when they're making enrollment decisions. It's a promise educators can look to when they're making career choices. And it's a sure sign to students about how much their school cares for them. Without contract language, those promises mean nothing, which is detrimental to our students' education. I support House File 1691. I believe the provisions in this bill and those under discussion will improve learning conditions in our schools, give parents some welcome clarity about how their children's schools will operate and strengthen the labor movement. Thank you so much. Thank you. We now have uh, three public testifiers. And um, I have first up from our department, I believe. Yes. <laughs> uh, Megan O'Reilly. Or really are la <laughs> close. <laughs> Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Megan Ariola. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the legislative coordinator for the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak in support of the language in uh, HF 19, 1691 that aligns with Governor Walz's legislative platform for education, specifically sections three and four of the bill. Uh, section three of the bill removes a prohibition on tier one teachers, tier one licensed educators from joining a collective bargaining unit, allowing all educational instructors to join a collective bargaining unit if they so choose, affirms their importance to their students and their school communities with the same level of professional union protections as their other teacher coworkers. <clears throat> Section four brings early childhood family educators and adult basic instruction educators who are licensed through Pelsby within the defini definition of teacher for purposes of receiving continuing contract rights, ensuring that all teachers have access to opportunities under continuing contract rights like participation in teacher development and evaluation, protection during layoff without notice, and due process in the event a proposed termination of the teacher's contract affirms the value of teaching as a, as a profession. As this legislature and the population as a whole looks at solutions to the nationwide teacher and staff shortage, these provisions are one part of the larger picture of our shared goal of getting caring and qualified educators in the classroom and retaining them through a supportive teaching and learning environment. Madam Chair, Representative Jordan, thank you again for allowing us to speak in support of these provisions. Thank you. And actually, if our next two public testifiers could come up at the same time, then we'll be able to move more quickly. I have Marianne Thomas and then Kirk Schneidwind. Thank you. And I, I do apologize. And I do have um, Ms. Thomas up on, on my list first. So if you would go ahead, identify yourself and proceed. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Mary Ann Thomas, Director of Human Resources with the Farmington Area School District. And I'm here to testify today on House File 1691 on behalf of school board superintendents and principals. Um, so this bill has a lot of things, and I know I don't have time to speak to all of them in it, but there, I do. we do have some concerns regarding some of the provisions in this bill. Um, the main concerns we have are regarding the things that are changing to mandatory subject of bargaining, class size, staffing ratios, e-learning. And the reason that we have concerns with those are primarily financial in that the whole budget is only so big. And if you um, lower class size, that means we have to hire more classroom teachers. If the total budget for the school district stays the same, that means we're going to have to cut other things. We're going to have to cut custodians. We're going to have to cut paraprofessionals. We're going to have to cut administrators. And so that remains a concern for us. In addition, the probationary period reducing from 120 to 60 is very concerning. We are hiring people for the long term. We want to make sure we get this right for learners. And even if, let's say we go to 100 days, that allows people to take their FMLA leave if they so need to and still be able to um, evaluate them. But 60 days doesn't do it. 
uh, isn't enough time. There are a number of other provisions within this bill um, that are concerning both from a cost uh, standpoint and from an implementation standpoint. But due to my time frame, I'll just thank you for my testimony and I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is Kirk Schneider, Executive Director for the Minnesota School Boards Association. And um, because of the time issue, again, I will emphasize to the issue around the probationary teacher period. But let me back up for a second. I, I will echo what was shared here. This is a very comprehensive, big bill that re will require a lot to unpack. There just is for, for our school districts. So the probationary period um, is an important piece for us because we always want high quality teachers and we're afraid that moving that 120 to 60 days is gonna be a challenge for many of our uh, evaluators and principals who do that during the year. I think the default to that is that many times as we know when we go through the ULA or the unrequested leave process that um, when in doubt, districts are gonna do that. And I think that's the challenge is when you have young uh, rising star teachers and they may not have hit their stride in the first year, in the first 60 days um, or 90 days of the evaluation, I think that's an opportunity that we want it, we, needs to be addressed. I think the second part that we are concerned about is um, is again, the, the terms and conditions of employment have expanded, as noted here, expanded to a point where almost every issue for our boards will be required to have a negotiation. And the, the legislature gives strong direction to local school boards to govern and manage and take care of their district. And we are concerned that many times if these become a term and condition of employment, that whether it's on student testing, um, uh, the length of day, or whatever the issue may be, is something that will slow down the process and the progress that districts are making. And thirdly, I will just point out um, is the issue around the data practice uh, changes that are being made in the bill. Um, I think there's some concern about the, the amount of data that will be required, the districts to share union membership with the union and there may be some individual employees that may not want that information shared. Um, secondly, I think that um, now that we have, because school districts are, uh, are required under the Minnesota Government Data, data Practices Act, um, those provisions that now are within this bill could fall under that and that data would be available to the public as well. Um, Madam Chair, I will conclude my remarks there and thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you, thank you. All right, having uh, no more testimony at this point, we will take uh, member comments and questions. Uh, Representative Ewan King. Sure, thank you. And maybe it's just some clarifying questions. Mr. Schneiderman, can you please come back up here? Thank yes. you. And thank you for returning and handling the question. And if and you can identify yourself again as, yes. we, as we go into this section, thank you. Yeah, my name is Kirk Schneiderman, Executive Director for MSBA. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. and I, I know this is going to judiciary on the data portions, but just, as, just to clarify for me in my mind, is the head of the local bargaining unit able to access um, the email system to send out to employees, and what you're concerned about is that the, the union itself would have that data? So I'm a little confused there because the steward should be able to reach out and contact their fellow union members. Right. Mr. Scheidman. So, Madam, Madam Chair, I believe the, the question, the, the, the issue that has changed is now it's from May, it moves from May to must. I think that's the point that, um, and I think that's to your question, Madam Chair. Uh, and I, I think a further follow-up on that. Yeah, is, so I, maybe I'll take this offline because yeah. you're basically telling me that a union steward would not be able to access their, that talk to people that, that they're supposed to be representing because it's a, districts could decide because it's a May that they don't have to do that. So that's a little concerning, but that's judiciary. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I just maybe, I have a, like a final comment. If you want me to do that now, it's not a question. Representative you okay? Oh, actually one question. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your opinions. <laughs> I really have not had enough coffee. So I did not hear any of you talk about being concerned as you have in the past, which I'm very glad because we all can evolve that tier one teachers should be part of a bargaining unit? 
Mr. Schneiderwin. Madam Chair, and I, I think because there is so much in here that I think that, that we focused on the three issues. I think that um, I think that would be an I wouldn't say we're opposed to it, but I think that we there are some concerns with that. I think that but would certainly love to talk more about it. So Okay. Madam Thank Chair. You. I'll just go to comments uh, comment. then. Uh, um, Chair you came. Since fifty percent of our SPED teachers are either tier one or two, right. they need to be part of the bargaining unit. And we have other bills coming forward about their needs as well. Um, and I want to just say, I do completely understand the pie of the money that districts get. We are trying really hard in education finance to make sure we're actually funding our schools so they can do their job. Right. What's hard when we talk about this is you're looking at the pie versus what's good for our kids. And that should be in the forefront of, we need to have lower class sizes. We need to actually retain our teachers. We need to figure out ways to fund that, to have that goal, and then how to fund that versus uh, we're doing the best we can with the money we have. It's a paradigm shift. I know it's like moving the Titanic. It will take a while. But I, I just want us to kind of try to keep that focus. And, um, we talked in another bill about what should or shouldn't be in bargaining. So I'll kind of put it to you this way. We could either have it be part of bargaining and have it be that local control with your school district, or we could put class ratios in statute. So we're going to have to have that fuller discussion because we have overcrowding in our schools. We have teacher burnout. We have problem with retention. You have people burn out. They're not coming back. There's a lot of issues we need to fix together. So I think, you know, conversations offline and ways to make a bill better instead of just no, which I know you guys are very open to that, but just want to make sure we're laying the groundwork to actually in the next two years get something done really good for our schools. So thanks. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Mueller. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is a, a question for the bill author real quick. I was looking and with the question and the concerns that were brought up about the um, personal data that was requested from uh, from a teacher to go to the union. Um, and we heard from our testifier that they're concerned that it went from May to must. I just wanted to know what the, the reasoning on that. And listen, I, I hear uh, Representative Joachim what you're talking about, how we should be able to contact, but, our, but there are people who do opt out of the union. And so I wanted to know what that, what that actually I just need some clarification around that, please. Thank you. All right. So we've got a, I think we've got a couple strains going here. And, and one is a reminder, too, that this is going to the civil, the, the data privacy part of it is going to be handled in the other committee, too. But I think that uh, so a lot of this question would be uh, addressed here is what it looks like. I'm going to turn to you, Representative Jordan. And then if you have a, a resource person on hand to um, clarify, we can also turn to that person. Yep. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have with me um, an attorney who specializes in this from Education Minnesota, Meg Luger, who could better specify some of the answers, some of those legal questions. But it is going to judiciary. There will be um, amendments made to it in judiciary. Those are not worked out yet. But um, I would turn it over to uh, Ms. Luger. All right. Please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Meg Luger Nikolai. I'm an attorney with Education Minnesota and here to represent our 80,000 members. Um, the question that Representative Mueller has asked, I think, is an excellent one and raises an important point. Since 2018, no one is required to be in a union. However, prior to 2018 and thereafter, unions have an obligation to represent everybody in a bargaining unit, irrespective of their union membership. And so what this means is we may need information in order to, to, to duly represent someone, even if they do not choose to be a member of the union. This enables us to get that information without, for example, having to go to the Bureau of Mediation Services to ask for an order, which obviously increases cost to everybody. And so and one, the other thing to keep in mind, and, and it, it, risk of sort of <laughs> trying your patience about jurisdiction. This language is limited to the information necessary to carry out the functions of Chapter 179 and 179A. So it is not a, you know, we don't get people's dental records from when they were five or anything like that. What we need is the information that's relevant to folks' job duties. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Follow-up, Representative Mule. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate that. Um, there's a difference between needing my, like getting my information and talking to me in, as an employee than getting my personal information. And that's something that I think that should be clear. I understand what you're saying, and that even though um, people who choose not to be a part of the union, you still have the obligation to 
um, represent those teachers, even though I mean, that's for another conversation. But um, that's a, that's something that I mean that's still me as an employee versus me as person, and so that's something that I just think is really concerning that you would have my personal information. You know, as we look at these things where we've heard now with the testimony about how this is really usurping our our school boards and our, our local school boards and our local bargaining units. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, Representative Yuakin, that either, you know, we, we all have the same goal of making sure that we have teachers who are able to do their jobs, that we have students who are able to learn, that we have smaller class sizes, and that we're trying to fund, and I know this isn't finance, and I'm not on finance, so this is the only time I get a chance to say it, is the fact that we want to be able to fund schools adequately. Well, you know, frankly, we have been putting I mean, it's 40% of our budget, and um, I'm not advocating for any decrease in it. I'm simply saying that maybe as a legislature, we would actually direct more of it to our local schools. And maybe then they are actually able to lower class size because then they are actually able to hire more people or actually able to do this, pay its teachers more, whatever it is. But how, it, how it's set up right now, we have so much restricted funding for certain things that it isn't able to address the things. And simply putting it in statute and the, the either or thing that you just said about either, I wrote it down, either we, we mandate you do it in your local bargaining unit or we, we put it in statute. Well, frankly, there is another option and that other option is to make sure we have unrestricting funding so there is something, I'm, I'm sorry for, you're the one who said it, so that's what I'm saying. So, um, and so that's, there is another option. This isn't an either or. There is always an opportunity for us to unrestrict some of this funding and put it directly to our school boards, directly to our classrooms, directly to our teachers. And frankly, simply saying that we as a legislator have to mandate that is, is exactly what our testifiers have said that they don't want because it does usurp their authority. So thank you, Madam Chair. And as customary, when, yeah. when we're uh, directly addressing someone, um, I will give the moment for response. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chair Yokeen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anybody that knows me, I'd be happy to talk education finance with you at any point in time. Um, but no, what I was trying to get to that is that we need to start putting the kids first. And with the class sizes and everything else, we have to get a handle on this. And we can either let people negotiate that at the local level, or we're going to have to start doing something up here. And that's just where my head's at right now is focused on the kids. And I know we keep saying that education is 40% of the budget, which is great. But when our budget pie may be shrinking because of the proposals, let's say they did in a press conference yesterday on taxes, that 40% gets smaller then. And so I just wanted to reiterate the importance of making sure that we're putting kids at the center of the focus of our decisions here. And thank you for letting me have the time. All right, uh, good spirited debate. Um, Representative Bakeberg? Yep. Um, I know that we also have Representative Berg on the list, so um, I'll we'll let you go first, right. uh, Representative Big Berg, and then, and then we'll finish with uh, Representative Berg. Thank you, Madam we'll Chair. Um, I would 100% agree we need to put kids first. Uh, I, I would hope that there's not a person in the room that would do that. Um, but those of us that are in schools on a day-to-day -day basis understand that uh, that doesn't always happen. So. I think we need to go back to a previous comment and, and we need to trust our local school districts. They are working with the, the resources that we give them and they are, are squeezing every cent out of the money that they, they get from us and being very creative in doing that. So, so we need to do that. I have significant concerns. I don't think it's shocking to anyone in the room that there are a multitude of issues in here um, I would echo our testifiers, so I won't belabor the point. Um, I want to speak and just be very clear. I was a member of Education Minnesota when I taught. And um, I'm an administrator now, so I'm not. But I want to make it maybe more to our, our Education Minnesota partners. Um, outside of the metro, there is a lot of distrust that I hear constantly about Education Minnesota from your members, that you don't represent them and their interests and that you're more concerned with Minneapolis and St. Paul, to be very frank. So 
I've had people say I'm being bullied to join the union. So when I see things about personal data, that concerns me about personal emails, personal phone numbers. Education Minnesota members have reached out to me and said that to me. Okay, they have said that. That's not my words, that's your members' words. So when you're saying you're representing your members, I would just encourage you to get all of your members' feedback. And that's hard and I get that. But I'm gonna just end with, um, let's get back to putting kids first. Let's do that. Let's put kids first. And part of that is paying teachers and paying paras. To, so we have the best ones in the classroom. I don't disagree with that for a minute, but the mandates within this are, are just not going to help kids, period. Thank you. Okay. And I'm gonna, uh, uh, our bill author, <laughs> Representative Jordan, uh, for comments at this point. Madam Chair, this bill doesn't promise any outcomes. Okay. There's no mandate on class size in this bill. There's no mandate on staffing ratios in this bill. This bill merely says that they can be negotiated on. And so that when districts are saying, look, we have a major budget shortfall, or look, we have this many resources, we're trying to prioritize class sizes, or we're trying to think about um, how much time we want uh, children in, in, in assessments that aren't mandated by the states or the feds, this gives those educators a voice over what's happening in their classroom. It doesn't mandate what happens in their classroom. That is still a local control issue that needs to be negotiated between districts and their bargaining units. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Berg, I have Representative Frazier still on the list and then we'll go to Representative Bennett and then back to our bill author for closing comments. Thank you. Representative Berg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, real quickly, uh, the, the data piece of this uh, keeps coming up. It came up in labor. I expect it to keep coming up. I'm a flight attendant. I'm required to give my employer my personal information as it changes if I move, as it changes if I get a new phone number. I am required to be contactable. They have my personal information. I'm a person and an employee. Teachers are required to be contactable by their administration, by their schools, as a person, as an employee. Unions disseminate critical information to their members. Uh, as, as a union steward and as a president of my local, my members contacted me all the time when we needed to go to, to uh, grievance procedure, um, arbitration, any of the things that affect their actual job, which is also in conjunction with the employer. And I'm so glad that Representative Baker made the point that if we are going to get the feedback of all Education Minnesota members, they're gonna need their personal contact information. Point was made, I appreciate your recognition of that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Berg. I guess we, you know, I mentioned by name. Uh, there are many ways of getting communication. Okay. That's so in, interesting discussion and another committee that also can work with this particular provision. Uh, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the bill author and thank you to, uh, I think this has been a lively conversation. Um, quickly to what uh, Representative Bakeberg said about the contacting with Education Minnesota members. I've had the, the, the honor to travel a fair bit around the state to talk to different educators. And they're not all gonna agree on the same thing. The agenda is not gonna be the same. But I've also talked to folks that are in districts to say, the district doesn't support me. The only connection and resources and support that I feel is from my union. My union's fighting for me. They're advocating for me. They want to, they want to address the issues that are in my district. Disparities, uh, discrimination, racism, inequities. They help me address those issues. Without that, I feel like I'm on an island and I don't have that support. So I, I agree, you should talk to all folks. But that goes both ways. You have to talk to all folks. Um, to the bargaining piece, adding these issues to uh, mandatory bargaining, I, I know from years for actually sitting at the bargaining table, and, and I'm, I'm unique. I've been on the management side, so I've been on the side where I said, no, we're not gonna bargain it because it's not a mandatory subject of bargaining, right? And we closed the door. And I've been, I'm, uh, I've been on the labor side. Well, we absolutely know that it's important to bargain that. I heard someone say that we, wanted, we want to give folks that are closest to the action the ability 
to make some change or address issues. I don't know how much closer to action you get than the folks that are in the classroom, to those teachers and those parents. And they're here asking that you give them the ability to help shape something better for our kids. And I think that's important that we keep in mind. And we are talking about our kids, and we got people here that are fighting for our kids. So I want to center that as we do this. And again, this is about the ability to bargain these things. It's not forcing anyone to agree to any particular term and condition. Just the idea to bargain it. We shouldn't be afraid to bargain things, especially when we're looking to focus on what's best for our kids. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Representative Bennett. Thanks, Madam Chair. Quick question and then a comment, if I could. Um, and for the bill author, um, can the school, in here it says the school email system is, uh, the union is guaranteed um, access to the school email. So my question is, can that email be used for political purposes, uh, such as campaigning? <coughs> No, okay. Chair. So I'm sorry, <laughs> Representative <Chair>. Jordan. <laughs> well, to... Madam Chair, Representative um, Bennett. No. Okay. Madam Representative Chair, Bennett. Thank you. And is that clarified in this bill language or somewhere else in statute? Representative Jordan. Um, Chair Pryor, uh, Representative Bennett. I would defer to uh, Ms. Luger for that one. Madam Chair, Representative Bennett, that's clear in there's case law that's relevant to this in. Uh, out of St. Louis County, and there's another Court of Appeals case which makes clear that public funds can't be spent for electioneering activities. Okay, thanks. thanks. Representative Bennett, and you, you, I think you, did you comment at this point? Yep, quick comment, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for that. I think that's important to clarify. I know in some of my local districts, it has been used for that, and I've kind of emphasized I believe that's wrong, so I think that's a good thing to communicate. And I think um, it's good for our labor unions to have access to those email systems for their uh, communication purposes. I think that's good. And just a quick comment, I guess I, I have significant issues with a number of things, but I'm going to talk about that personal information because it's coming from teachers. And I know for me, I, I guard my uh, personal cell number and email. And um, I would like that choice. So I would encourage you to put an opt-in for that. Um, I just think that's the respectful thing to do. It might be legal to ask for that or whatever, but I think respectfully, whether it's the person's a union member or not, that's just a respectful thing. So thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Closing comments, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Committee, for your time. Um, I will be brief. Our Teachers' working conditions are our students' learning conditions. Teachers want to be able to advocate for their students' learning conditions, and this bill gives them the tools to do that. So I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, members, I re-refer my motion to second. Uh, Judiciary, <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. I, I got to get your the right bill number, too. All right. I, I turn down. There we go. All right. I renew my motion to re-refer House File 1691 to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 The motion carries, and the bill moves. Thank you, Representative Jordan, for being with us. Um, as you all may remember, we have an extended time today um, as part of our makeup day, our snow day. And next up is uh, uh, Representative Jordan, Lead, Lead Bennett's. All right. Thank you, uh, Representative Bennett. We have um, before us House File 1589. All right, and uh, I will leave it to you, um, uh, Representative Bennett, to make the motion to uh, refer re-refer House File 1589 to Education Finance Committee. Thanks, Madam Chair. Do I do that first before we work on the amendment or add the amendment? There is an amendment. Okay. Yes. Um, I apologize for that. Okay. So um, we'll we'll bring the the bill um, before us, and you have an amendment to offer the A1 amendment. I do, Madam Chair. Thank you. The A1 amendment simply uh, clarifies that um, when it's um, this applies to not only unlicensed staff and paraprofessionals and so on, but also a teacher with a tier one or tier two license. All right, any questions on the A1 amendment? 
Seeing none, um, all in favor of adapting the A1 amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, uh, you have an amended uh, bill. Um, please introduce yourself officially and uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and do I need to move the bill now or no, we're good to go? So um, say the question again. Uh, I'll, <laughs> yeah, so move. All right, yeah, so we have, right now we have, um, we have House File, uh, the 1589, is that the right number? Before us, okay. 1589 before us uh, as amended to be re-referred re to education finance. Thanks, Madam Chair. And to save some time, can I just ask my testifiers to come up now while I'm that talking? That sounds we'll great. Do Thank two you. things Thank at you. once. So, uh, go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, members, House File 1589 addresses an issue um, where special ed uh, teachers, well, we all know special ed teachers are at a premium and very difficult to come by. This just helps our schools recruit teachers, uh, special ed teachers um, from paraprofessionals, non-licensed staff, tier one and tier two, helping them get into our teacher prep programs and become licensed teachers so that we can get more licensed special ed teachers. This uh, is very similar to what is called the Grow Your Own program, which we have heard before. Um, and actually, quite interesting, we'll hear about this, I think, but the Grow Your Own program actually came from rural Minnesota and started with uh, some of the uh, people we're going to talk to, or will talk to us here. And the word grow came from the rural farmland area, so I thought that was kind of an interesting background. But with the Grow Your Own program, it has really become unusable for our rural schools. It started out um, to, to be uh, usable, but it gradually became where it was being ratcheted up for um, targeting minority populations, which is really good. But it also ruled out rural schools being able to grow their own professionals and licensed teachers. So I'm. You know what, I'm gonna just be quiet right now because I think my testifiers will do a much better job explaining this than I am. So Madam Chair, if we could move on to uh, our testifier here, Dan. All right, uh, please identify yourself and proceed. I am Dan Armagas, I'm the Executive Director for the Southern Minnesota Education uh, Consortium. I'm here today to support House File 1589, the Special Education uh, Teacher Pipeline Program on behalf of MSBA, MREA, MESA, and the MESA organizations. This uh, committee is uh, aware of the teacher shortages that our districts are currently facing. Finding licensed staff is becoming more and more difficult. This is nothing new in the, in the field of special education. We have been facing this challenge for years. SMEC formed in part due to the challenge, uh, challenges of finding properly licensed staff. In 2008, we created our own Grow Your Own program, sending teachers back to school to become licensed in the areas of need. Over the next few years, SMEC went from contracting most of our specialists to being able to sell services and from sending students out of our co-op to offering a full continuum of services. Sending staff back to school is a cornerstone of who we are as a, co as a cooperative. It has helped with teacher retention and recruitment. We have always made sure we had staff in the pipeline attending school to become licensed teachers. Currently, 47% of our tier three and four special education teachers were sent back to school by SMEC. Our partners at Region 10 started offering tuition support in 2017 and we have sent back 79 teachers to become licensed. Federal funds can no longer be used for this purpose except for fully licensed special education teachers. Currently, 34% of the special education teachers, teaching staff of SMEC are tier one and tier two licensed. We would like to offer tuition supports to these teachers but can't due to the limits of the use of our funding. This has strangled our flow of qualified staff and will continue to have significant effects on our students. This is where House File 1589 can help. It fills the gaps in funding and will bring new teachers into the profession. The state's uh, current past and past Grow Your Own grants have not been accessible to the rural districts who are also struggling to find teachers. Uh, Ms. Bednar is a teacher at Lyle Public Schools a district where currently 75% of the district's special education staff are tier one licensed. 
She's an ex excellent example of where tuition support could have benefited the teachers, the students, and the district as a whole. Hi, thank you for having me. As he said, my name is Bree Bednar. I teach high school special education at Lyle I High could, School. Could you just pause a moment? Yeah. Um, I do need to recognize you before you proceed. Yes. Thank sorry. you. And I'm sorry, if you could uh, start again with your name and, and then where you represent. Absolutely. So I am Bree Bednar, and I am the high school special education teacher at Lyle High School. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. In my 20s, I taught middle school language arts for four years. Because at that time I taught at a private school, I wasn't required to carry a teaching license. When I left that job, it was with a heavy heart. I loved teaching, but recently divorced, I was pushed to seek a higher paying position. I spent the following 15 years serving my community through nonprofit organizations, most of which were in executive leadership roles. My desire to help others overcome barriers and see them succeed is what drives me. This desire and my lived experience as a person with disabilities ultimately drove me to find my way back to teaching, specifically special education. As I was making the decision to undertake this major career shift, an important factor was my district's ability to cover the co my cost for attaining the teacher licensure. Unfortunately, shortly after school started and I'd already fallen in love with each of my students, I received difficult news. Recent interpretation of the law prohibits my district from using federal funding to send tier one teachers back to school for this licensure. This news has created considerable hardship in the plans I had for a lifelong career back in teaching. In following my passion, I took more than a $14,000 a year pay cut to take this teaching role, but I did it with excitement and with the understanding that my educational costs would be covered and I would move, into, move up the pay scale over the next several years. Not only did I take a considerable, considerable pay cut, but now I'm being asked to pay an additional 11 plus thousand dollars to complete the education needed to ensure I will have valid licensing credentials when my tier one license expires. The young people I have come to adore are the ones that will ultimately suffer if I am unable to find a sustainable solution. Since the beginning of last school, school year, they've already had four different SPED teachers in the position I have filled. Understandably, their trust in me hasn't come easily. They've asked me countless times if I'll still be there next year. My students deserve consistency, as well as a highly trained educator. I want to be this for them. For Minnesota's future, the cost of not having qualified educators in special education is astronomically higher than the tuition I need to move forward with securing my state-mandated credentials. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go to public testimony now. Um, and I have up uh, Shana Morse. Please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Shana Morris, Assistant Director of Government Relations at the Department of Education. First, I'd like to start off by thanking Representative Bennett for bringing forward this bill. This is an important topic impacting students, educators, school leaders, uh, and it requires a legislative solution this session. As you've heard last fall, the U.S. Uh, Department of Education's Office of Special Education Programs, or OSEP, released a memo clarifying states' obligations regarding the requirements for personnel uh, qualifications under the Individual Disabilities Education Act, or uh, IDEA. This clar clarification from the feds impacts approximately 800 tier one and tier two teachers in Minnesota who need a path to, uh, to progress towards full certification in order for us to maintain compliance in the state, which is why the, per uh, the amendment is particularly helpful and we appreciate that. These roles that the individuals play are critical for the educational success of students with disabilities. They serve as a resource, an advocate, and a mentor. They help students with disabilities receive their, uh, achieve their full uh, educational potential and so just as we know that those roles are important, we also know the struggle that districts are, and schools are facing related to staffing. Without action to support these 800 tier one and tier two teachers to move uh, towards full, full certification, excuse me, our districts could face even more difficult staffing challenges. And more importantly, students with disabilities could lose access to the services that they need to help them succeed. And I recognize the committee that we're in here in policy, but this policy is an issue, I just wanna take a second to say, that does need a budget uh, solution. The governor's budget has a two-pronged approach to increasing access to teacher prep programs and to mentoring supports. 
It builds off the existing Grow Your Own program focused on teacher diversity by adding a prong dedicated specifically to uh, addressing teacher shortage areas, uh, specifically also emphasizing uh, the shortage of special education teachers. Complementary to that is increasing access to uh, 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 a complementary in to increasing access to licensure programs, rather, is um, a mentoring support program, which is also included in the governor's budget to ensure that there are adequate supports for those individuals. Again, we appreciate the author bringing this forward and the amendment that came with it and look forward to continuing to collaborate uh, towards a solution on behalf of the special education teachers and the students we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Moglison. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And we will not miss Mr. Shaver for public testimony this time. Thank you. Please identify yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Laura Mogelson, and I am here from the Minnesota Association of Colleges of Teacher Education. Uh, thank you, Representative Bennett, for authoring this bill and bringing it forward. Uh, MACD is highly supportive of House File 1589. Um, as it's been shown by Pelsby's supply and demand report from uh, this year, the licensure areas uh, filled with the highest proportion of teachers holding a tier one and tier, or tier two license or out of field permission are in special education. And as the previous testifier shared, we do have over 800 uh, tier one and tier two teachers. And as Representative Joachim has, has stated earlier, over half of our uh, special education teachers are at tier one and tier two. And so this, this, um, this policy and funding is clearly uh, needed in our state to uh, help prepare and support uh, the tier one and tier two, tier two teachers, as well as the many, many paraprofessionals that are in our districts. Thank you. Um, to uh, receive a high quality teacher preparation and earn a tier three special ed license. Uh, MACD is very excited to collaborate uh, around solving this problem. We've actually been uh, talking with our colleagues at Peltzby about this for quite some time. Um, uh, the memo that came from the Office of Special Education Programs, um, uh, which the previous testifier also talked about, um, is of great concern to us, and we feel like it's very important to bring our state into full compliance with IDEA uh, rules, and this uh, legislation will provide the needed support to help move our Tier 1, Tier 2 teachers to the Tier 3 license. Um, we also are very supportive of the um, uh, fact that it will reach all of Minnesota, not just the metro area, and have many, many members who are willing um, to provide programs and access. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, our last public testifier, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you. Chair Pryor, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Matt Shaver. I'm policy director at Ed Allies. We're a statewide education advocacy nonprofit working to ensure every Minnesota student has access to a rigorous and engaging education. I'm here to testify in support of House File 1589 as amended. I want to thank Representative Bennett for taking our feedback and thoughtfully amending the bill to make it even better. There's a very real shortage of special education teachers statewide with unique local and regional and even within district challenges. Uh, and access to effective educators for students with disabilities is both a moral and legal imperative. House File 1589 would create another means by which the state can address these shortages by creating resources for districts to partner with board approved prep programs to increase the supply of effective educators to support students. We're strongly in favor of making state funds available to educators who are interested in enrolling in board approved teacher prep, whether they are paraprofessionals, district staff, or tier one and tier two teachers who choose that path for additional training. This is a grant program that has the potential to do a lot of good for students and our educator workforce. Thank you, Representative Bennett, for your leadership on House File 1589. Thank you, Chair Pryor, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you all for your public service to our state. Thank you. All right, that's it for public testimony right now. Um, we can turn to member discussion. Yes, Chair Yuki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, quick question. Uh, actually, first, thank you, Representative Bennett, for bringing this forward. This is a really important bill. Thank you for the amendment. Um, one thing, and I wanted to thank um, Ms. Mogelson, too, from coming coming forward, because I've been speaking with MACD, because one of the concerns I have is making sure that 
there are programs out there in Minnesota for our, our SPED teachers to take while they're still working, so they're not leaving the classroom, and that are accessible and affordable. And it sounds like um, we have some really great Minnesota-based folks that can do that. So I, you know, we're wondering if you're considering as this bill moves forward to finance, to put something in here that they have to collaborate with Pelsby to figure out what those programs are. We do that with the Grow Your Own program. And then also, if there, I would like to see a focus on those tier one and two teachers that are currently in the classroom, moving to the tier three with this money, because that's the immediate problem. And then moving into more of getting more um, teachers into the classroom for SPED as well. And I had to laugh. I've gotten like three texts that I could have subbed today because I forgot to block off this month. In, in the classroom. So yes, I know how important that is as a SPED para to, to get this help into the classroom. But if you could look at those two things and we can talk offline too, but Any thank comment, you for that. Any comment, Representative Bennett? Okay. Thanks, Madam Chair. And absolutely very open to that. Um, we need to make this bill the best we can so it actually works. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other, see, I've not seen any other member discussion at this point. Uh, lots of agreement that this is uh, an important uh, a bill that we're bringing forward to right now and that fortunately we'll be moving it to Ed Finance and talk about how to really make this happen in our state right now because it, it's it's time. We have to do it. Uh, so closing comments, Representative Bennett, and if I can just throw out a reminder, we're going to still do a vehicle bill right after this. We'll just take like 30 seconds. Uh, closing comments, Representative Bennett. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks so much for hearing this bill. And, and just to reiterate, um, I know SMEC uh, in general has 34% of their special education teachers right now at Tier 1, Tier 2, and we all agree that we want to see those people be able to uh, get to the proper, proper classrooms, get licensed, and um, that's so much needed in our special ed in particular. I also want to emphasize that this bill will... Uh, have metro and rural, it has to be equally divided between, so this is going to affect our schools and help schools in our entire state. And uh, But especially in rural who, right now those schools cannot access the current Grow Your Own program due to some stipulations. So thank you so much, appreciate the hearing, and we'll look forward to uh, more discussion, hopefully in Ed Finance. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Um, with that, we will renew the motion to re-refer House File 1589 as amended to Education Finance Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Education Finance. All right. Uh, with that, I will turn over the, the gavel and we'll quickly do our vehicle bill. Very good, our final bill up for consideration today is House File 1313, coming to us from uh, Chair Pryor. And Chair Pryor, would you like to make a motion uh, before the committee to re-refer this bill to the General Register? That is my motion, thank you, Mr. Chair. Wonderful, now that the bill is before us, Chair Pryor, please introduce your bill. Uh, this is House File 1313, it's a vehicle bill, which we hope we don't need, but you never know, so here we go. Um, appreciate your support for this. Wonderful. Uh, any discussion from members? See no uh, discussion or questions. Um, Rep. Pryor will now renew her motion to re-refer 1313 to the General Register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Very good. The motion prevails. Thank you, committee. And we are now adjourned. Thank you.